This is Dr. Bruce Walkey in his teaching on the Book of Psalms. This is session number one, Introduction, Survey of Approaches. To take our shoes off our feet as we step onto most holy ground. We're about to step into your holy word and into the words of your people that celebrated you and prayed to you for over a thousand years from the time of Moses down and beyond the exile. And their words to you their praise to you, their petitions have become your word to us. We cannot make you talk. Our exegesis is totally inadequate. You must speak to us. We depend upon you. In your great grace, you were pleased to reveal yourself, your heart, your purposes, your character, and what you're up to in history. You gave it to us in inspired scriptures, totally trustworthy, so that we would have a sure word of prophecy from you. And you completed that circle of revelation by giving us your spirit who helps to illuminate your word. And we know that without the enlightenment of the spirit, we are dark within. We cannot see. Thank you that we have the Holy Spirit that opened our eyes, that enabled us within scripture to see the son in whom you are well pleased. May we delight in him as we read words from your people and ultimately from yourself that speak of him. Our sufficiency, Father, is not of ourselves. We take what you've given us, what tools you've given us, but our real sufficiency is of you, and we praise you for it. Each one will be hearing these lectures differently. Your word is unchanging and has a definite meaning, but it will be heard differently by different people. The rich will be sobered. The poor will be consoled. The lowly will be comforted. And the high will be warned. It meets us all differently. No teacher is sufficient to meet that need. Only you can. Father, we do not barge into your presence or into the heart of anyone unless we're clothed in your spirit. May it be your word to us. And may we respond with our shoes off our feet. In Christ's name, amen. All right, it's a delight uh, to be with you and share the book of Psalms. I f began to have my first serious interest in the Psalms back in 1958 when I was teaching exegesis at Dallas Theological Seminary. Exegesis meaning to the Greek words ex, out of, ago, lead. So it means to lead out of the text what the inspired author intended his text to mean. It's the opposite of that, eisegesis, where we read into the text what we want it to mean. We are submissive to the word. We allow the word to come out of the text to us. So I taught exegesis, helping students to read the text appropriately, 
But to read a text appropriately, you have to read it holistically. The sum is always greater than the parts. And the parts have meaning within a whole. So therefore, to teach any book in truth, you really can't just teach a portion of the book. You have to read the entire book, and then you can go back and understand the individual portion. And that's difficult to do, especially in the Old Testament, where you're dealing with 50-some chapters in Genesis and, you know, the Pentateuch, you're dealing with uh, multiple chapters. So I thought, well, how can I teach exegesis in small portions so I, they could see it holistically and then understand the parts? And it came to me the best text for teaching exegesis was the Book of Psalms because they're about anywhere from well, Psalm 117, you have three verses, up until Psalm 119, and you have, what I have, I don't know, eight times 22, 176, is it? Do the math, I'm not a mathematician, my checkbook never balances, but in any case, it's, it's, they're different lengths, and, but the average length would be about 10 verses, I think. So therefore, it was an ideal book for teaching exegesis, and of course, it's such warm, uh, rich, that speaks to our deepest emotions, our anguish, and yet also our, our, our joy, exuberant joy. And so it runs the whole gamut. Every emotion you may experience is going to be expressed in this book. So it just seemed an ideal book for teaching uh, exegesis. My next major encounter with the book was in uh, 1968 at Dallas again. And um, at Dallas, they had um, four times a year, they would bring in a, a, what they thought was an outstanding expositor of a given book. And those were the best two weeks for me every semester, two weeks in the spring, fall, two weeks in the spring. And they would bring in wonderful godly men and very competent in exposition, exposition being the counterpart of exegesis, exposition, is to set it forth. And so it's one thing to bring out of the text. It's another dimension when you have to put it forth in a palatable manner so people can eat it and enjoy it. So the exegete is like the farmer who has to bring the weed in out of the field, but the expositor has to grind it and make it into bread and make it attractive and so that you want to eat it. So that's the difference between exegesis and exposition. And uh, anyway, in 1968, they asked me to do the exposition, which is a whole other dimension. But I thoroughly enjoyed it, and what result of that, now I had to read everything on, on, uh, on Psalms. And so I began to be aware that uh, fundamentally, scholars were coming at the book in different directions. And so the lectures were basically different approaches to the Psalms. And I'm still going to be, even today, that's basically how we're going to come to the Psalms. We're going to be looking at different approaches to the Psalms. So then also I uh, worked on the, uh, I work on uh, the committee responsible for the New International Version. And so therefore, because I work in the Psalms, almost, I was always constantly being put in the Psalms when it was time for the translation of the psalm. So it was kind of a little bit of my, my fault. There were other men much more competent than I, and I learned one thing about the NIV, you learn a lot from the, it's like a great seminar, and you learn from one another, so it's a unique opportunity for the translator. And on then, I periodically taught the psalms in different contexts. And um, now I'm writing a commentary on the Psalms, and I have the great privilege of working with Professor Houston. Professor Houston is, uh, was a lecturer in history at uh, Oxford University. And so we have worked together. I said, told him I wanted to write a commentary on the Psalms. He says, well, you need the historical, whole historical interpretation, what the church has said about it. Well, I'm not a church historian. So I said to him, well, I'm not competent to do church history. And uh, so I said, would you collaborate with me? And you write church history. And tell us what the history of interpretation is. So our book on the uh, Psalms as Christian worship 
is a combination. He gives the voice of the church for uh, up until the Enlightenment, and I give the voice of the psalmist. So we have the voice of the text, and then we have the voice of the history of how the church has understood the psalms. So it's been a wonderful camaraderie to work together with him. I've learned volumes, and to me, I, the Middle Ages and all back there was just not my fort at all. Not now either, but I have a better awareness, thanks to my good friend, Professor Houston. And we put out another book, The Psalms as Christian Lament, and now we're working together on a third book, The Psalms as Christian Wisdom and, and Praise. So that's where we're presently working. Right now I'm working for, with the great honor for the biblical training. And I'm very thankful to Bill for giving me this privilege for teaching and extending the ministry. It's just a delight to collaborate with my good friend Bill Mount. So I'm very delighted to be a part of this process. You should have in hand uh, your notes, as I said. And uh, we're on the very first page, I think. No, it's actually page two. And we have there the uh, syllabus. And I begin with a bit about the course uh, description. And basically, I'm beginning by saying that of, of all the books of the Old Testament, the Psalms is the most popular with the Christian community. The law is most popular with popular, the Torah is the most popular with the Jewish community. But the book of Psalms is the most popular with the Christian community. And you could see that by the way publishers will publish when they publish just the New Testament very often they will include within it the books of Psalms and Proverbs. It's very normal publishing and publishers don't publish unless there's an audience to read them. So therefore I think I'm on fairly solid ground to make a judgment that, is, that it is probably the most popular book within the Christian community gives expression to every emotion, from wrenching anguish, protest against God. I'm very honest, where is God's justice when they're suffering unjustly, when the wicked seem to have the upper hand? And they don't hide, they don't, they don't conceal that problem with which we all wrestle. Uh, and they, they give expression to their pain, and they they talk about the absence of God in distress. Where are you, God? And even Christ on the cross gives expression to it. My God, my God, why did you abandon me? And he went through that same sensation. He was tempted in every point as we are. And if you're tempted on occasion and you say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Know that our Lord has experienced that same experience without sin. And so it expresses all these emotions that we have. And not only because it's published, but also I would say it's the most often quoted book in the New Testament. It's quoted maybe over about 250 times. There can be some debate about it, where you have illusions and you don't have illusions. What amazes me is that the biblical writers were not formally educated. Uh, they were not scribes. And yet, they had such a control of scripture that they were use it, able to use it so deftly, sometimes very exegetically, very what it depended, but often very creatively, and using it for new situations. And that these fishermen had this kind of knowledge. It just astounded the scribes and the lawyers and the educated in the rabbinical circles. Where did these men get this knowledge from? And of course it goes back to the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit uses what was already, uses often what's there. I think they must have memorized the scriptures. So they were just simple lay people without a formal education that spent their lives in the Psalms piously. And therefore, they can breathe the Psalms when they pray, when they sing, 
Like in the book of Revelation, when John hears the angels singing, he really is hearing the, like the book of Psalms, are very similar. Mary's Magnificat, for example. And they just pick it up. And Paul will say in Romans 8, uh, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Where did that come from? Psalm 44. And they can just pick out, it's just part and warp and the weft and woof of their, what is it? Warp and weft, or whatever it is. It was just part of their fabric that uh, these sobs were part of them. And I think that's true of, of most of the people listening to these lectures, that they've been in the Psalms for years, and often, almost everybody knows Psalm 23, right? It's one of the most famous texts in the world. It's no longer than your little finger on a page. But it transforms a whole life. It's amazing. Such a little text could do so. It's that powerful. I often say, people say that one picture is worth a thousand words. And I will say, one, six verses of Psalm 23 is better than a whole gallery of pictures for what it can do for us. It's very powerful. So it's, uh, and I, I honestly believe Jesus memorized the Psalms. I've known people who have memorized the Psalms. And as I put in the notes, I just gave one quote from Alan Cooper, the latest book that I've read on the Psalms is the Oxford Handbook of the Psalms. I don't, it's got some good essay, essays, it's got a lot of, I don't think very helpful essays. And it costs about $100, so. I don't know that I, it's okay. <laughs> I'm not here to critique it. But anyway, Alan Cooper, I, I quote it there for you, and he says that, this is in the first paragraph, early Christian schools, especially monastic schools, introduced young initiates to the study of scripture through the Psalms and selected New Testament text. Once admitted to the monastery, the neophyte had to commit psalms to memory and recite them while performing his daily chores. So they committed to memory, and then throughout the day as they worked, they would recite the psalms, and that would just become part of their character. In the early church, to be a bishop, you had to memorize the entire book of psalms so that you could examine the, the priest to make sure, or the monk, to make sure he knew the book of Psalms. So they actually memorized the book. I've been teaching for you, I haven't done that. <laughs> but it gives you some idea of the importance of this book within the history of the Christian church. So it's, been, it's the first book ever printed on the Gutenberg printing press. Uh, one of the first books that are always translated. So it is, I think I'm fair in saying, it's the most popular book within the Christian community. And we are privileged to be studying. And we're part of a 2,000 year history. So we're not de novo. <laughs> uh, we are part of a community, a history of study. And we're participating in the same spiritual food that has nourished the church for 2,000 years. This has been the spiritual food that has made the church what the church should be. And were we more imbibed in it, were our preaching more biblical and less therapeutic? I see a lot of preaching today being therapeutic and psychological. And it aims to make people happy, but it doesn't make people holy. And if we had more of the Bible and exposition, we would have a holy church and not, I think, a little bit too lackadaisical church, Amen. more disciplined in our approach. So. Then the second paragraph, I'm talking about the complexity. However, of all the books of the Old Testament, I would suggest it's the most difficult because it's, it's, it's written over almost a thousand years. The oldest Psalm is Psalm 90, which is by Moses, the man of God. So that goes back somewhere around 1300. 
Some psalms come from after the exile. Uh, in fact, Psalm 137 speaks about when they were in Babylon and their tormentors said, sing us one of the songs of Zion, and that we're going to see that that's a distinct kind of psalm. There are about five or so psalms that are songs of Zion, and they say, sing us one of those psalms, the songs of Zion. Well, they which celebrate how great Zion is, and there they are, exiles, and their temple is in ruin. Their king, his crown is rolling, his crown is rolling in the dust, and they're just mocking these people who profess to worship God. So it extends all the way. In fact, the the evidence from Qumran suggests, and this is a bit debatable, that if it, it, it reached its final form, fixed with no rival ways of grouping, at about the time of the beginning of the Christian era, before that, about the time of Jesus. Now that's the uh, uh, logic, uh, that's a, a great extension. I think it was myself fixed before that, but that would be the terminus from anybody's, from anybody's viewpoint. But my point is, this is over a long period of time. And there's all kind of material in it. There's all, there's, uh, there's protests, there's, uh, you have the imprecatory psalms that you pray that God will, uh, blessed is the person who takes the Babylonian babies and bashes them upon the rocks. That's difficult stuff in the Christian community. How do you understand that? Uh, it's very complex with all their emotion. How, how do you understand the real honest expression, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't fit Christian theology very well. That I'm always with you, I'll never forsake you. And yet they're saying, you have forsaken me. So it's a very complex book. It's not easy, therefore. And you're in a seminary now, and so you have to deal with hard academic questions. And I'm not, this is not a church. I have to address the real issues of this book. Did David really author the Psalms? In my community, you could scarcely be hired in a reputable university if you said David wrote the Psalm. There's a definite prejudice. I mean, if you, if you, if you have a conservative viewpoint towards scripture, there's no openness. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm speaking to an academic community as well as to the church. But you have to handle the hard questions that are being raised and that our seminarians are being uh, uh, taught. And I think it's one of the reasons that the pulpit is more, no, more, not more vital because you come out of the seminary, you can't go through a coal mine, you can't go into a coal mine in a white suit and come out without black on you. And I think it's very hard to go through most of our seminaries and universities without being blackened to some extent. Maybe I've been blackened to some extent. Thank God for the blood of the Lamb that makes us white as snow. So, but it's a, a difficult book in many ways. So we have to ask the hard questions. Another difficulty I have with the book, with the teaching it, is that when you talk about God, there's something inauthentic. It seems to me it's very difficult for me to talk about God. He's my Lord. The only appropriate way of speaking of God is in you, O Lord, second person, not third person. Because when I talk about God, I tend to distance God from us. And you tend to put yourself almost above, I'm talking about God. That's an awesome concept. How do you do that? It bothers me. And yet, as in theology, you have to do that. And yet, so I always feel a little bit inauthentic. I wish, I wish I could speak and write the way Augustine did in the Confessions. He never talked about God. It was always, you, O Lord. He always has talked to God in second person. He's unique. So my genre is academic, and you, it tends toward the scientific. So I ha I'm, I'm, we must be aware of that problem, so that we're always coming back to the you, O oh God, to a personal relationship. One time I took the, taught the Book of Psalms at Victoria University in, in BC with uh, 
secular students. And I began by saying, we, I know we're all used to the scientific approach, that you look at an object, you hypothesize about it, and you test it out, but it's an object out here that you talk about, scientifically uh, explore and try to validate your hypothesis. I said, if we do that with the Book of Psalms, we will destroy the very purpose of the book because we will have made it so we cannot hear God. And what we did was I asked the student to come up to the front of the room, stand in the corner, and I, the rule of the game was that you cannot talk to the student and he cannot talk to you. You're not even sure he's a person. So now, all we can do is talk about the student, observe what we see. And so they began that way. And then after a few minutes, they began to realize they had put themselves into the position they could never know that person. They were coming at it the wrong way. I can't come to know you by talking about you. I have to listen to you. I have to come with spirit to you. And I have to come with some sympathy. If I don't come with sympathy, then I'm going to misread whatever you say. And I find that in sometimes where people don't like my position. What I thought was totally innocent, they bastardize it and make it opposite of what I intended it to be. Sort of like the movie The Blind Side. Remember where, they, where this family in Mississippi took in this black student and they meant kindness. It was truly a Christian act. And then the social case worker came along and said, they're just using you and poisoned his mind. They're only entertaining you so that you will be a great star on the Mississippi football team. They're not really interested in you, they're interested in the team. Judge their motives and poison that young man's mind. And it took a while, and at the end of the movie, this uh, black student, terrific person, he identified with the family, and he said, that's my family. It was a great movie. But what my point is, if you start questioning the motives of David, and he's just using God, he's an upstart, usurper to the throne, you're going to totally misread him. And many academics read him that way. They come with a, uh, they come with a uh, hermeneutics of suspicion, to quote from Paul Lacour, that you have to approach the text with some suspicion. So that's kind of some of the stuff I'm talking about, a lot more than I'm having the notes here, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's what we got there. Now, if you have any questions, uh, this, write them down, and then we're going to have a break, and we'll, we'll entertain the questions at uh, that point. The second part of the syllabus, I talk about what are the objectives of the course, and you can kind of hear some of the objectives of the course. Um, Paul says, you know, famous verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is inspired of God, and then he tells us what its purpose is. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, truth, doctrine. And that would be truth. It's profitable to know who God is, doctrine. It's for the servant of God. It's profitable that you know who you are as a servant of God. So it's a knowledge of yourself, it's a knowledge of God, and also those two are, as Calvin well understood, in the double knowledge, that as you know yourself, you know God, as you know God, you know yourself. The more you know God, the better you know yourself, the better you know yourself and how sinful you are, the better you understand the holiness of God. Well, at any rate, it's, it's for doctrine. And the Psalms, are for doctrine, and it has a lot to say about God, a lot. Uh, and what's interesting, what you have here is you don't have the doctrine of God from an apostle, you don't have a doctrine of God from uh, a prophet or a Moses. You have the doctrine of God as the people of God understood him in the book of Psalms. This is where the church is, if you please, where the people of God are and what they understood about God. And it's right within their whole fabric of thinking. So, the point of this is to know God, and to know who we are. And one of the things that really will come through 
of who we are is that we are in contradiction to the wicked. It's a black and white between those who depend upon God and those who depend upon themselves. And we'll see that. We are defined by our dependence, our meekness, our childlikeness, our dependence. Now, I don't know the average person thinks of him or herself that way as a totally dependent person. But that's what will come through in the book. So it's profitable to understand ourselves. And um, it's profitable, therefore, when you understand truth, then that rebukes you because we all fall so far short of what reality is. We all live in irreality. We're all a bit insane, <laughs> some more than others, because we're not living in truth, the reality of God. When you're not living in the reality of God, you're somewhat insane. You look at the world through wrong eyes. Well, anyway, so then, but it doesn't leave us there. It corrects us and instructs us that we might produce all righteousness and we'll become the salt and light of the earth. So that is the function of Scripture and it's partly the fun and it's certainly the function of the Psalms. Now, it may surprise you, that is not the real objective of my course, is to teach theology. That would be a different course. And I've taught biblical theology of different books, but I'm not doing that. I'm not giving teaching biblical theology of the book of Psalms. I'm doing something different, something more preliminary to that, so that you can become the theologian. And what I'm trying to do is to give you glasses to read the psalm uh, authentically, so you can understand the Psalms better, and therefore your theology is more authentic, more solid. So you have to have something more fundamental. The method must precede the, to get right results. So you have to have the right method. And that's what we're going to be trying out, different approaches to the Psalm that have been used over the years. And when I taught the course in 1968, that's what came through to me. As I read the literature, people were coming at it in different ways, and some of it good, some of it bad. And I was gleaning what I thought was good. And so we're going to be looking at that uh, in the course. There's a wonderful saying that by Adele Berlin uh, at the University of Maryland. And she said, you don't know what a text means until you know how it means. And we're going to be learning how it means. Let me, one of the approaches is called the rhetorical approach, the poetics. This is very, this is very dramatic. This would be outside the sub. If you would, turn in your notes to uh, 303 of your 352 pages. So as, as I recall, it's on page 303. I'll get there. And I won't get there ahead of you, fortunately. Let's see. Get back to page two here. Yeah. Uh, on page 303, under the rhetorical approach, I'm trying to share part of that approach is to understand how the literature is structured. And the biblical writers did not structure their material in the same way we normally do today. We normally structure on a very linear path that this A, B follows A and on down the line. Much of biblical literature follows a different structure. It goes A, B, C, D, maybe. And then it escalates it. And then you go back. A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime. That's a very common pattern. And unless you have that lens that that's what they're doing, you, you don't figure out what's going on here. We just said that, but they've said it more intensely. It's just the way they do. That's called, um, that's, uh, that's called alternating parallelism. There's another kind, so, uh, another kind, and that is called chiastic, but now that's really a, an in thing these days, a chiasm. 
And a chiasm is from the Greek letter key, it has a cross to it. And a chiasm is, and your concepts of words go the A word or the A thought, and then they followed by a B word or B thought, and then C and D. And then it goes to uh, an X. And then you go back and you get a D prime, you go back to this thought just before the X. D prime, and then you go back to C prime, that matches C, and you go back to B, that matches B prime, and so forth. And that's a common, very common. We're just learning that. It's all through all the ancient Near Eastern literatures, and it's, it's the vogue thing in academia today. A third pattern is not the chiasm, but what I call concentric. It's sometimes not separated, but I think it should be. And that's where you go A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. So uh, there's no X. So you can think of it in terms of water. If you want to understand uh, um, concentric in the way I would use the terms, it's, it's, it's sometimes used this way. It's, not, it's my way of putting it, really. You can think of it as a tide. Tied in, tied out. A, B, C, C prime, B prime, A prime. Uh, you could think of chiastic parallelism as throwing a rock into a pond. You throw the rock into the pond, and all the waves ripple out. And the wave at the left end of your lake matches the wave at the right end of the lake, and they all ripple out. And then you got the rock in the middle. That's the X. The alternating parallelism, I think, of, uh, of, tide, of waves and a tide. So the wave comes in, and then a bigger wave comes in. That's alternating parallelism. Now, that's used in the Psalms. And those are different kind of structures, and we're going to have to point them out as we turn to different kind of psalms. But to illustrate it, here's, here's alternating parallelism on uh, uh, page 303, and I used uh, the parallelism of uh, Elijah's experience at Mount Horeb. Remember, he was fleeing from Jezebel. He goes down to Mount Horeb, uh, and he wants, I think, a revelation from God, and the, the difficulties to find himself. So he goes back where Moses got a revelation from God. And I, he's in the cave there, perhaps the same cave Moses was in when God passed by. And so he begins by saying, uh, the story begins on page 303, this is 1 Kings 19. A, the setting at the cave, and the word of God came. Followed by the Lord's question, what are you doing here, Elijah? C, he now answers, I have been very zealous my, for the Lord my God, and they want to take my life away. D, then the Lord said, E, now comes the wind, remember the theophany, the wind, ripping apart the rocks and the trees, and we're told the Lord was not in the wind. Then comes an earthquake that shakes the earth, and destroys the, you know, the ter terrain. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Then comes a fire, but the Lord is not in the fire. And then we get a sound, an oxymoron, a sound of sheer silence. It was so silent, you could hear it. <laughs> I think we've all I've been places where it's so silent, you can hear it. So, now notice what happens. Now comes the alternating parallelism. Now we've got A prime setting at the cave. And a voice came, followed by B prime. Question, what are you doing here, Elijah? C prime, the answer. I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts and so forth. And now they try to take my life away. D prime. Then the Lord said, everything's exactly the same, but now we get the parallel. Instead of the wind, we got Hazel, who brings destruction. Instead of the earthquake, we have Jehu, who killed off the whole house of Baal and brought death. And the next one is Elisha. Who, call, who called the bears down, who called, yeah, the bears down on 42 children, for example. And it makes it clear what he's up to. And he says, 
Hazel kills, Jehu kills, Elisha kills. What's the parallel? So the parallel to the wind, the, 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 uh, the wind is Hazel, the parallel to the earthquake is Jehu, the parallel to the fire is, is uh, Elisha. What's the parallel to the sheer silence? The 7,000 that didn't bow the need to Baal. You couldn't hear them. See, once you understand that, now everybody's wondering, what's the sheer silence? And everybody interprets it any which way. But it's not authentic. Because they don't know how to read the text. You don't know what a text means until you know how it means. That's a famous saying. And this is extreme when you get into it. But one of the things we're going to touch upon is the rhetorical approach. Let me give you an illustration of... uh, uh, chiastic parallelism from outside the psalm. But we're going to see all this in the psalms. But here's chiastic parallelism. This is in the story of, uh, uh, the story of Solomon, the, autobi- the biography of Solomon in the first 11 chapters of, uh, 11, first 11 chapters of uh, Kings. This course, of course, assumes some fundamental knowledge about the Bible, and the book of Psalms does too. The superscripts assume you know the history. I mean, you shouldn't be in this course if you don't know anything about the Old Testament. It's, this is a bit more advanced. I mean, it's, you know, it's all profitable. It's like Augustine said, that the Bible is shallow enough for a child to wade in it, deep enough for an elephant to drown in it. So, so anyway. But try, try, notice this chiastic parallelism. This is in the biography of Solomon in 1 Kings 1 through 11. And what I'll do here is I'll match A and A prime immediately. Okay, here's the prayer. Here's how it starts in 1 Kings 1 through 2.12. A prophet intervenes in the royal succession, and you have Nathan, who's putting Solomon on the throne instead of Adonijah. Then, notice, jumping to the next page, A prime, how it ends. A prophet determines the royal succession. That's in chapter 11. 26 through 43. So it begins with a prophet putting a king on the throne. It ends with a prophet taking a king off the throne and putting somebody else on the throne. That's how it ends. So I, I think you can see A and A prime match each other. Notice B. Solomon de- eliminates the threat to the enmity, and uh, uh, the threat uh, to his security. And so he removes Joab, he removes Adonijah, everyone who was in the uh, coalition, and very legitimately, because they each condemned themselves. The son of Saul, Shimei, for example, uh, the, his rule was you, you had to stay in the city, uh, you couldn't go elsewhere, and then a slave runs away down to southeast Judah, and he leaves the city, which shows, first of all, he doesn't obey the king. It shows he's a no good man, because a slave doesn't run away from a good master. He's a cruel man, so it gives you an insight into it. But the point is, it's, he removes all the threats, and the end of the chapter says, and so uh, his throne was established. Now the counterpart to that is B prime. Yahweh raises up threats to Solomon's security. He raises up uh, uh, Jeroboam, for example. He raises up the uh, Syrian kings, and he raises up everybody who's against Solomon. So it's a total reversal. So you have the prophet put him on the throne, you have a prophet taking him off the throne. You have eliminating threats, now you have new, th- new threats matching each other. Now you get C. You have the early promise of Solomon's reign, everybody under his own vine and his own fig tree. But C prime, the tragic failure of Solomon's reign, and he doesn't deal wisely with his allies and so forth. Then you have uh, D. Solomon uses his gift for the people. D prime, this gift of wisdom. D prime, the tragic failure of Solomon's reign. It becomes, uh, it becomes self-absorbed. He becomes richer and richer, and he's totally self-absorbed, and losing his kingdom as a result. Then you have E, preparations for building the temple, and that's matched by Solomon E prime. Solomon dedicates the temple, but worn by God. Then you have... F, Solomon builds the temple, and then you have F prime, Solomon furnishes the temple through Hiram, the, uh, the coppersmith. Notice the pivot. 
Solomon builds rival buildings. The pivot is he built a palace for Pharaoh's daughter. He built a magnificent judgment hall called the Forest of Lebanon. It had so much cedar in it. And he built his own house. But he stopped building the temple. It's right in the middle of the building of the temple. So he's building the temple, and then he stops. And now he starts building his own mansion and palaces. That's his downfall. That's the pivot. And otherwise, if you don't understand, you don't have this lens on to understand Kaiser, you said, what's this all about in the middle of chapter 7? And all of a sudden, if you understand it, it's the most crucial section of this passage, which seems irrelevant when you first read it. So what I'm saying is you don't know how a text means, what a text means, until you know what it means. And that's what I'm concerned about. I want to help you to know how it means. That's preliminary to doing any theology. And then you can do your own theology when I hopefully can give you some lenses and, and make credible the traditional positions of the church. And so it's somewhat apologetic because I don't agree with most of academia. I think they're leading the, 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 the novitiates, the new seminary students, down a false path and hurting the church. So that's what we'll be doing. That's what we're looking at. So, now what are those approaches? That's the objective. I want you to understand the approaches that we're going to be using. And one of them is the historical approach. That's the traditional approach. And we have to... We have to ask when the NIV translates of David, is that the best translation or should it be by David? Of David is a fudge translation. Almost all translations do it without making a decision about it. But it's Lidavid. It can mean either belonging to David or of David or some way. It's open or it can mean by David. And I'm going to investigate that, that the historical approach. And what difference does it make, whether it's grounded in history or not? And what does that all have to do with, it, with Jesus? And so those are the questions I have to ask, and we're going to look at it, the historical approach. The second approach we're going to be using is uh, what's called the form-critical approach. And the form-critical approach distinguishes uh, groups the Psalms according to their different types. So basically you have three major types of psalms. You have some divisions of them, but you have hymns, songs of praise. And it's in the hymns, the songs of praise, that we get the doctrine of God, primarily, because there they celebrate his attributes and they celebrate his two things, his acts of creation and in history and his faithfulness to his people. So we'll look at that, the, the hymns doctrine of God. We'll also look at, uh, in form criticism, we'll look at petitions, that prayers. And there, for example, you can do the, the, just the, what you can get theologically. For example, there's no petition without praise. All petitions are doxological. There's only one exception, Psalm 88. It's called the black sheep of the Psalter. Why is it that Job could protest, wish I was never born, and call into question God's justice? And God rebukes him, and he has to repent. And the psalmist does exactly the same thing. And God is pleased. What's the difference? The difference is Job had no praise. A petition without praise is not, not acceptable. It's an expression of unbelief. And once you start understanding the form, you see, it's, you have to know how it means to know what it means. And once you understand there's a distinct form here, then you're in a position to compare all these psalms and compare it with other scripture. But that's the kind of thing I'm trying to give you lenses to see so that you can understand so you understand it's doxological, and when you study them as a group, you also learn they're communal. 
They almost all end with a wish, not just for me, but for the whole world, for the whole community, that I will be part of a witness to the entire world for what the Lord has done to me. And when we share our testimonies, we encourage one another and we share the gospel that way. And that's how the gospel has gone on. So they are doxological, I would say. They are communal. And they're highly, highly humble because what they're doing is, take the imprecatory psalms, they will not take matters into their own hands. They depend upon God. The righteous are dependent upon God, and they stand opposed to the person who avenges himself. Now keep in mind here, what happens all too often, people take what's meant for the people of God and apply it to the state. And that's a big error. It will destroy the state. The symbol for the church is the cross. The symbol for the state in Romans 13 is the sword. And you have to keep those ethics distinct. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about the church. The world is a different story. But that's its own discussion again. But, so I'm saying, I began by saying it will give us doctrine about, uh, doctrines about God. And I said it will give us doctrine about saints. That's important distinction. And that's what Paul said. So that the man of God, the saint of God, may be equipped to every good work. And the, the scriptures were written for the church, for our edification, so that we can be good salt and light for the world. Well, so that's, that's something of what we get into form criticism. And it's how, I'm trying to help you to see why we get into these things. Because later on, we get into the, the fars and all the details, we can lose a big picture of, of where we are and what we're doing. A third approach we're going to use is the liturgical, that the Psalms were sung at the temple. How do we understand that? How did the temple function? How did it speak? What's its symbolism? And so we're going to be looking at the temple, and we're going to be looking at the processions of Israel as they're reflected in the Psalms. So we're going to be in the temple and understanding what's going on in the temple and uh, describe that temple a bit. Sometimes it's very paradis paradisiacal. <laughs> I think that's a word for the word paradise and adjective form of it. All right, so we'll be looking at the liturgical approach. And then what the, one I, uh, the, the one I gave you earlier from uh, the parallel, the uh, structures, that's the rhetorical approach. Now, we're going to be using the rhetorical approach all the way through the course when I deal with individual psalms. So I'm not going to have, um, I'll just summarize the material there. In almost everything I've written, like the psalm, uh, commentary on the psalms or my Old Testament theology, almost everywhere I lay out right at the beginning the rhetorical approach so people know where I'm coming from and how I'm reading the text. My real objective, say, when I wrote the Genesis commentary, my real objective was that the reader would learn how to read. And so I begin every section with that rhetorical approach so you know how to read. That was the intention at any rate. Then we will have the eschatological messianic approach. That is, how do these sound? They speak of Jesus. He said they all speak of him. And he opened up to them on the Emmaus Road, he opened up to them the book of Psalms. And we're going to be looking at that. How do they, this is part of the complexity. How do we understand its history for David, and yet it's also speaking of Jesus? So that, those things have to be grappled with in an, an authentic, uh, authentic way. So you can see where we're going. And finally, we're going to ask ourselves, it's called redaction criticism, but we're going to ask ourselves, how was the whole book put together? What was the redaction? What's the editing? Why is it in five books? And how uh, are, are these books, are these psalms connected in any way? Or is it just a willy-nilly collection that, with no meaning to it? I will argue there is meaning. But this is at the very... This is the edge of scholarship today, where we are, is in <coughs> understanding the editing of the book. I think you could see, if we go through the Psalms this way, you're going to have some idea of the content of the Psalm. 
uh, you know, I'm not going to say, uh, this is Psalm 1, Psalm 2, Psalm 3. That would not be my approach. My approach is a little bit more, uh, I hope, sophisticated than that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these different forms. We're going to look at Psalms broadly in each case. So you get a, a total picture. And then I will zero in on a particular psalm. Because the truth is what we really enjoy is the psalm itself. And I'm going to be sure we, every lecture we're going to get back and actually do a psalm. Because that's, we just, nothing anyone can say can match the text itself. So let's just enjoy the text as we go along. So that's the objectives of what I'm up to, where we're going. I hope you enjoy the ride with me. I enjoy it. I learn every time on this tour through the Psalms. There's your calendar where we're going. This is the introduction to the course. The next lecture is on hermeneutics. And it's critical that you read the text with a pure heart in the right way. And most academia does not read it through the lens of a, of the, a, pure, a pure theological heart. I'll talk about ethics, but that's fundamental, that you have to... So much error in academia is because they come with wrong presuppositions to the text. And so I think it's worthy of a lecture to talk about what do you think about scripture? And the truth is, if you read, for example, uh, the brilliant, brilliant scholar Walter Brueggemann, very popular today, and Walter's just a brilliant guy, but I don't know what his doctrine of scripture is. He never lays it out on the table. Truth is, I don't think he has one. I don't think he has a doctrine of scripture. I mean, he has so much good stuff, but I want to know where you're coming from. Is it the word of God? Is it the word of God? How do, you, how do you look at this book? And normally that is not addressed, and it causes a lot of confusion. We're going to be looking at Gunkel. He's one of the greatest scholars. He's the one that is the father for criticism. And he deals with, he has so much data, it overwhelms you. You know who the psalmist is, the righteous? If I, he says it's primitive religion. What he means is he's got a psychological problem. He's paranoia. And the enemies are in his head. And he does all this research and ends up, he's a psychic problem. That's the righteous. He never says it quite, that's, but that's what he is saying, and I'll quote it. <laughs> So it, rem <laughs> it reminds me of uh, uh, the Mona Lisa, the greatest painting. Well, at least people know something about it. It's the most famous painting, renowned. And if you've gone over to Louvre, you hardly can get into the room with the Mona Lisa. It's packed with people. And everybody's concerned about her uh, quixotic, enigmatic smile. How do you explain that smile? And so I was reading articles on how to explain that smile. And one lady said, I understand it. It's the smile of my little girl when she pees in the bathtub. I mean, you mean trashing a picture. That really trashes it. <laughs> and that's how she saw it. So I'm saying, Herman Riggs is crucial to how you see this material. So that's my second lecture, is on hermeneutics. It'd be, but it's legitimate for any book you were going to study in the Bible. And then you can see we're moving then into the historical approach, and then we'll do a psalm, and then uh, even after the introduction, I'm going to do a psalm one, and we'll always be interspersing it with psalms. And as you go through there, you can see uh, the different kinds of psalms we'll be looking at, different approaches we'll be looking at. And I'm saying we're going to look at a broad approach and then head, uh, do a specific song. This is Dr. Bruce Walkey in his teaching on the Book of Psalms. This is session number one, Introduction, Survey of Approaches. Mm -hmm.